is the one thing about Vegeta's character from beginning to end that you have taken sort of, and you're basically, what is the thing you admire most about the character of Vegeta? I think the thing I love about Vegeta the most, the thing that I'm really uh, proud of to be able to play this character for, is he has had the most change over the series of any other character. <laughs> Some of us coming from like, hey, do you like Piccolo or Vegeta more? And I go, well, okay, let's talk about Vegeta's backstory. He had a really crummy childhood. He was like raised by a king. It was a like horrible planet where they destroyed things and like. And then it was taken over by someone else, the plant was destroyed, then he kind of meets somebody, his son comes from the future, blah, 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 blah. And then he has a wife, and blah, 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 blah. And all these things happen to him, and then Piccolo, he comes from an egg. <laughs> That's it. So it's just, what I love about Vegeta is he's constantly adapting, and he's becoming such a better person that it's hard to believe that at the beginning of the series, I have to remind myself and some people like, wow, you guys all, you let your kids wife like wear Vegeta shirts and stuff. That dude killed people. <laughs> like, he killed Nappa just for sucking or something like that. <laughs> I think so it's just his, his ability to kind of adapt and change just to become a better person is what I love about him. As a performer, um, what we, what, and I don't know, I can speak for everybody, for, my, for myself, what I love is a character that has nuance. So, a villain, uh, or, or, or a hero, someone who's always the same, always just a badass, a bad guy, is not nearly as interesting as a performer as a character that has nuance, that has change, and that was the first word that came to me, and you basically uh, explained it, is there's change and a, and a journey. They want them to start somewhere and go somewhere. That's always so much more exciting to me. And then you get sucked in, drawn into what's happening to them when they're struggling, when they're in pain, when they're filled with anger, when they're filled with pride, when they want to uh, a, a, a fight, when they want to run. It's it's a, it's and and with Vegeta, it's all there. And that's what's so fun to play a character like that. あの、どうどう成長していく。あの、人としてというか、そこが素敵だなと思いますね。最初は本当にあの、すごく気分が皆さんだったんだけど、どんどんそれが変わってって、人間的成長していって、え、自分のために時間を守れなかったなかった。初
I don't know if I thought he did a very good job. <laughs> when it's your own voice and you hear someone else doing it, you don't know if it sounds the same as what you're doing. I will say, I love what Chris does right now with Vegeta. And had I thought of a voice anywhere near as with what you do, I would have done it in a heartbeat. But, but I can't do that voice, so I had to go with something far more princely, I would say. But I, 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 you know what, everyone always wondered, what, what was it like? Was it, was it, was it, was it take you off to, no. I, I, I was a working guy, I was working on other shows, and I was, uh, I, I was just, after when I first heard some of the work, I was pumped uh, that it was that it was still good. I think I was more worried that it was going to be the show was going to be bad and falter and not be any good. But everything I've seen of it, I love the fan base for years. I've loved, and um, it's just been a, a, a hoot to be a part of it. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Um, I, uh, I watched the Canadian version, obviously, uh, because I had to copy this guy. And for many years, I had two layers of, of trying to be humble about this role. Because there was the Japanese layer of, well, I'm not the, Jap the original Japanese voice. And then there was this layer of, well, I'm not even the original English-speaking voice of this show. And I was terrified because what we took over uh, for the Canadian cast, we were just like, we were just this tiny little studio in North Texas, kind of trying to throw something together. And we had taken these roles from veterans in this industry. I mean, Vancouver is just known for its stellar voice work. And so I was terrified of, of even trying to keep up with the legacy that he had already created for the character. And also not to freak out all the six and seven year olds who are watching the show that suddenly had all their voices changed. And it, it meant a lot to me when Brian came up, like I met him as soon as we got here, so it was the first chance I've ever gotten to meet him in person. One of the things he said to me was like, man, you did a pretty good job copying me. How long did it take you before you decided you weren't going to do that anymore? And was it like a conscious change or did you just change it because you, you, it just sort of fell down or something, it just sort of dropped and got close to your voice? And I told him that it was my conscious effort to kind of go from copying someone to actually playing a character because it's way... I just didn't want to end up spending my entire life copying the same voice. I wanted it to be something that I could really work with. And if I had to, if I have to copy something and act on top of that, it's just an extra layer that you didn't need. So I did. And if you can compare Vegeta, a picture of him from the beginning of the series, to a picture at the end of the series, you can tell he goes through a powerful transformation. He grows like testicles between his eyes. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, it was, a, it was huge, uh, huge shoes, and, I, and I, I started hearing his voice when we started working on the games, because originally we were recording in a vacuum, and we never got to hear the original voices. But then I was like, oh, darn it, this guy's amazing too. And uh, yeah, I've always had such reverence for Ryo, and I've heard all of his performances on every game and every show since like, like 2002, and it's always an honor to be around him. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
The rift with Bridgie's voice made it the right of making him alive. There's so much mutual respect here, it's awesome. <laughs> so, one of the, I don't know if you want to call it lost treasures or mysteries or whatever that, I don't know how many people here know about this, but there actually exists somewhere in Canada, somewhere, an ocean dove of Kai. <laughs> but nobody knows where it's at. Like, for real, it's like a big mystery. Brian told me they recorded for it. We don't know where it's at. My question, this is for everyone, is when you guys came back to portray Vegeta and Kai, now that you knew the entire character arc of the character from beginning to end, how did that affect your performance through the early episodes? Did you know he was, because you knew he was going to turn good eventually and be a father and all that. Did that change how you approach the character this time? I'll tell you the only thing that changed for me, uh, I was on a lot more shows and pretty busy. Early when I started uh, Dragon Ball Z, it was one of the first few voiceover projects I had, so I was just screaming my guts out for it. You guys heard some of the early stuff, that, that just the power stuff I would never do now, because that was the one and only time I've lost my voice in voiceover, was after an eight hour session. And they changed the rules, we're only allowed to do four hour sessions now. But back then we could do eight hour, an eight hour session as Vegeta, and had nothing left. I went out to dinner that night with friends, and it was, there was nothing left. I, don't, I, I just don't do that anymore. So the first thing I asked when I heard this dragon, this, this DBC Kai was coming, was, I, I know the show, uh, what, what's different about it? And they said, um, uh, the fights are shorter. Yes! That was just, that was all I cared about. The fights are shorter, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the greatest thing about working on Kai for us as a studio and, and for all the actors, I can speak, I think, on behalf of everyone who worked on that show. Uh, the best thing we got to do was really to go back and perfect some of the things that weren't right about the original. I, I, I tell everybody, like, go back and watch the orange boxes if you want nostalgia, if you want to remember your childhood. Like, if, if it's, if you want to hear cats love food, yeah, yeah, yeah. Walk, watch that and there's nothing wrong with it it's just its own thing but we finally got to go back and work on Kai where we really got to really dial in the, the correct translation and really accurate writing and got to tell the story for people who may have wanted to hear it more like the original and uh, we tried to keep the same flavor along the way but our main goal this time around was really to make it sound uh, as accurate as possible to the original Japanese while keeping kind of our English flavor to it. Also, when do you ever get a chance to go back and do something that you did 10 years ago again? Like, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing can be bad about that. That's the best, coolest thing, other than it being completely vocally stressful. And I think all of us were in a different place career-wise at that point. It was just, it's always nice to be able to go back and get a second chance to do something that you know is, is uh, beloved like that. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
Frankfurt in Japan, if he just wanted to phone it in and just not do anything, if he just wanted to go, ha, huh, or whatever, he could have. But I believe your reads in Super are better than anything you even did in the series. Like, it's amazing you really brought it. Vegeta, tragically, has died twice in Dragon Ball Z. Now, we, we never got to hear Mr. Drummond's performance as Vegeta dying the first time because with the original Ocean dub, they skipped from episode 53 to 123, I believe. And he never, the, there is no Ocean Freeze saga unless somebody can find those tapes of the Kai version or whatever. But the question I'm asking, this is more so for Mr. Sabat and Mr. Horikawa, is when you came back to Dukai and you did both Vegeta's deaths on Namek when Frieza killed him and Vegeta's deaths at, by his own hands against Majin Buu, did you, your, was your performance at that point like, did you try to put more emotion into it? Did you, were you cognizant of making changes for that, just those two moments? And also, which of the two deaths do you think was more important for the character? Not too much? No, not at all. Uh, it's... Let's see. The first time we, we recorded Dragon Ball Z, I was a much younger actor. You know, I remember it's like 10 years in the past, and I feel like my, uh, my acting arsenal and my skills had improved exponentially over the years. So I'm not going to say that I, that, I, that I worked any harder on Kai, but I do believe that my skill set was greater on Kai than it was the first time around. It was, I didn't treat it any less seriously, but I felt like my, uh, my instincts were really refined at that point, and I was able to do more nuanced things with it than I was in the original. Uh, also with Kai, we were recording over a longer period of time, so as opposed to the original series, as he was talking about, you'd go in and record for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, uh, my voice wasn't as torn up as it, as it was in the original, so I don't know. Um, I, I, I feel like I, I just tried to make good choices like I would on any show. As for which, which death was more important to Vegeta, I think that I, I think anyone who's any, seen any footage of me talking about Dragon Ball before, the Majin Vegeta is my favorite part of the whole series. Vegeta's death was more important to Goku uh, when he died at the hands of Frieza because I kind of awoke Goku's sensibilities. But when Frieza died uh, against Boo, he sacrificed himself. That was his choice. Like He chose to do that. And so I felt that that was really important for his character and really important for the beginning of this change. ま、仕事ということだと思うんですね。失敗するまたやり直すが出てる。2回目の人生はですね。で、また3回目でもまた違う成功になって進んで。そういう意味では非常に幸せな男だなと思います。I guess with the Vegeta's death, they kind of represented a failure, but he still had the chance to do things over and have a new life for himself. So really after dying twice, he had really had like a third chance at life, and at that point he became a happier man. But he still has many challenges and opportunities to keep aiming for. So let's talk about Copy Vegeta. <laughs> so in the Japanese version, Mr. Horikawa voiced both Vegeta and Copy Vegeta, but in the Dragon Ball Super English dub, Mr. Drummond made his grand return to voice copy Vegeta. I, I 
I've noticed the super dub does things like that. For example, during the Universe 6 arc, Chris Ayers' brother Greg Ayers plays Frost. So it's kind of like a little wink to the fans. Even though I'm, for Greg Ayers is a great voice actor, it's still kind of like, oh, that's his brother, his Universe 6 counterpart. We've heard Brian's version of how he got the call. So Chris, did you, when that art came, did you say, I want Brian? Was it like, how did that, what was your side of contacting him to bring him back and that whole story? Uh, I'll be honest, it was not as, it wasn't premeditated. Like, I didn't have the idea like months in advance. He can tell you how, how much time we had from the time I actually called him to do this and the time of the session had elapsed. It wasn't much, it was like about a week. Because in some ways, I was kind of dreading the copy Vegeta arc because I I was disappointed that Vegeta didn't get to fight Vegeta as much. Like I really wanted him to fight himself a little bit more. The only thing I found interesting, the thing I found at least the most interesting was Vegeta having a difficult time knowing who he wanted to root for uh, when Copy was fighting Goku. But I was I was about a week out. I needed to record the show. And I'm like I just wanted this to fight. But the engineers were like, hey, do you want to add an effect to his voice? Do you want to do something kind of interesting with it? And then suddenly one day I'm like, you know what? This, i got to get Brian Drummond to do this. This would be amazing. Because like, the thing I, I've heard so many of you say to me when I come uh, to conventions is, you know, this is the, the thing of your childhood. This is, and a lot of you, I, I know how you must have felt when you were really young and you were six or seven, eight years old, and then the voice has just radically changed overnight, and you just had to kind of go, all right, I'm gonna deal with it. But the, the thought to actually put copy Vegeta on a voice that I originally copied, I thought was so bad. <laughs> and the idea of, of giving fans of just that sound that they remember from their childhood was gonna be such a profound thing, I couldn't, I couldn't resist it, and it turned out better than I could have possibly imagined. So. It was, uh, yeah, it was a fun call to get. Uh, Chris and I, you know, Dean tweeted a couple times back and forth about some stuff, and I think you mentioned a couple months earlier, hey, you know, maybe we, could, we should get together for beers. Or, if, if something come up and you maybe want to do something, and I was like, ah, I don't know how that would work, and I'm not sure. And and, it, and, and as he said, it was short notice when, when he said, there's this part. He's kind of a, he's another Vegeta, sort of a purple slimy one, but yeah. He, and what you be interested in, I said, yeah, you know, I'm on a lot of other shows, so I was trying to figure out how I'd fit it in, and I mentioned, yeah, maybe I'll fly down to Dallas, and he's like, uh, I don't, we kind of need it, like, next week. And, and I was like, oh, geez, like, and luckily I had a Monday, this was like a Wednesday or something, and I, and I called the studio I knew and said, guys, can I book you for one of your free studio spots Monday morning? Uh, work it out. Uh, Chris and his crew will get in touch with you. Booked it for four hours, and I unfortunately didn't get any other gigs during that slot. I rolled in, and four hours we banged it out. Uh, Chris was was on at the beginning of the uh, session, and then you had to take off. Who directed you? Okay. Raleigh. Raleigh Pickens. Yeah. Okay. He's he, he a great guy. And then we just had fun for four hours. I really wanted to make it uh, seem. Uh, and, and I was actually glad. I, I remember I asked you, did you want me to sort of copy? your uh, Vegeta, and that might be kind of funny, but no, no, I think you said, that, you know, I want this to be the original, the higher pitch, the, the one that the fans remember. I'm like, okay, we'll do that one, and that was, that was, that was Chris's thought. I might have gone the way to closer to Chris's voice, but it was a great call to bring back the old school sound and, uh, and just play with that, and it turned out you know, better than I thought it would too, it was great. No, no, I actually, uh, it was a sound studio called Cosmic that I called up where I've got friends there and I, said, and, and I think I was working there that week and I just went up and said, you guys got a free spell on Monday morning, I need something really fast, it's going to be patched from Dallas and they're like, yeah, we can do it and we put it together. So, uh, yeah, great studio, man, Could we record most of it. Awesome. You look at the production of the English dub, not every actor has to be in the studio at the same time. So sometimes it'll be recorded kind of out of order. Like Chris will do his lines Monday and then Eric will do his Wednesday. They could be in the same scene together. But in Japan, it's a different story. In Japan, oftentimes they all record together. Mr. Horikawa will be in the room with Ma 
Oscar Nozawa or whomever, and they'll do the scenes together. So my question is for Brian and Chris now, and Mr. Horikawa, but we'll start with Brian and Chris. Do you think it would be easier if you had the other person in the scene there in front of you to kind of method act off of, or is it not really a big deal? I would take that a hundred times to one every day to work off another actor. Um, I, I do a lot of shows that are pre-lay where there's five, ten of us, uh, in a studio together, working on the, it's just the scripts in front of us. We don't have mouth flaps to match. We don't have times to match. You're creating every aspect of, uh, with the director of what's going to happen in that scene. You put it all together, and then because so much of acting is reacting, and um, it's great for another character can say their dialogue, and you can react to how they said that. But in in dubbing, like uh, like I said many times, I may go in and do all the Jesus lines. And I haven't, and, and the other characters haven't done theirs yet. So I have, I don't have anyone else's performance to react to. I can't even say, oh, can I hear what uh, what Peter did with uh, Goku? No, he hasn't come in yet. Oh, so I, I'm going to do a reaction line to something I haven't even heard yet. So you're you're just you have to make everything up. It's kind of like an actor working on green screen, which you can still do. You've got to react to something that doesn't exist that hasn't happened yet. Uh, most actors will far prefer to be able to work off another performer. So, oh, if I had an opportunity to do Dragon Ball with the full cast in the room, you know, on a weekly basis, that would be unreal. It would just be a blast to do so much fun. Yeah. Uh, you'd like to ask the two of them a question? Yeah.全部一人一人抜き取りというかですね撮ってるんですよ。あの、一緒に集まるのはないですよね。で、僕らは日本語はもう最初から芝居がそっちの方が合わせやすくなりやすいんじゃないコミュニケーションできるからあの感情もあ読めるしだから僕としてはそっちの方がやりやすいんですけれどまあでもあのスケジュールの関係で例えば誰かがその日にはいられないと
it's just too difficult for me to escape something that not looking right in the mouth. And it's so hard for me not to do it. I prefer to work off someone every day. And as the owner of the studio where we record the show, I usually get myself the luxury of being able to come in last. <laughs> so I get to hear everybody else's performances and then I get to make modifications to my line. So I kind of cheat in a way. I get to, I get literally the best seat. If you're the first person to record, it's like the worst because you're just recording just dry or in this vacuum. But if you're the last person, you get to, you're essentially recording with everybody else. Well, yeah, certainly if the show's already animated, there's no, like having everyone in the group, would, uh, I would find that to be completely uh, a difficult process, but I was more looking at it from the, from the scope of if Dragon Ball Z wasn't even animated yet, and we actually got to just do it all, and then they animated to our performances after the fact, that's the way I, I really love to work, because then actually your, your facial movements, they, many times I've filmed in performances, they say, can we come in, we're gonna film you guys, and they film what we're doing with our faces when we're angry or we're, or we're joking or we're doing things, and they'll use the animators will use those to create the shows, and that's a that's a prelay environment. And if there was a prelay environment of Dragon Ball, oh, it, would, it would be amazing. Oh, it would be yeah. incredible. There's one thing certain that I really want to ask you. All right, again. Okay. Are you looking at the script while you're recording, or do you have all the lines memorized? Whoa. I, I haven't memorized a line in a really long time. <laughs> no, script no, on screen. Yeah, we... You see the script right here, and the screen's right behind it. You're basically just having to follow both things at one time. Now... Same with you. Same yes, yeah. but yours sometimes comes in as not finished, but... Sometimes yours is like an animatic with the uh, mouth shape. Is that what happens sometimes? Or do you normally see the finished, completely finished episode?
it, it's crazy that Stacy there and I, we, we've been watching this series since the mid-90s and we're here in this big kind of vegetable sandwich. I shoot a piece of bread, I'm going to some bread and the vegetables are in the middle. It's just, it's just crazy. It's just crazy that we're here. So, this is for all of you. You have a great body of work. Every actor up here has a tremendous resume that speaks for itself in different things too, you know, not just Dragon Ball, tons of different shows. Is Vegeta your favorite character you've ever voiced? And if not, who is it? That's a loaded question for this audience, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vegeta, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's his Vegeta. I, uh, do you guys prefer honesty or that I lie to you? Honesty. Lie to you, man. Lie to you. Uh, Vegeta is one of my all-time favorite characters in animation. But, not one of my all-time favorite characters to voice because it, of how difficult it was, and is, for those who are still doing it, to do. It is extremely taxing and very hard on the vocal cords, and um, dubbing work is far more difficult than prelay work, the precision that's involved. You have to work by yourself, not with a group, not as fun for me. I love working with people as opposed to alone. So that's where I put not as fun, but as far as character arc and who the character is, and the journey he's been through, he's at the top of my list of all-time favorite characters. So for, for viewing, that's why I know he is for you too. But for work, oh, it, when, when, when a when Dragon Ball session would show up on my calendar from my agent, it was usually something like, <laughs> that's what my head would do. And when, um, how long? You have two sessions of Dragon Ball Z next week. Oh my God. <laughs> can you put him on a Friday so I can have Saturday and Sunday to recuperate? That's sort of where I sit with, with Vegeta. It's really hard. And so, I guess, and maybe you're probably aware of that. Um, and I know going into a session that it's going to take all of my, uh, all the power I have to even get through it sometimes. But as a character, like, it's hard for me to compare it to anything. He's connected with that character. I'd be nobody. I'd be nobody. <laughs> You're right, though. I don't know what I would be. And so it's so, it was such a, um, I don't know. I, it, it sucks to have to scream that loud and to know that I'm going to have flu-like symptoms the next day. Um, but, but Dragon Ball Z has given me so much that I don't have a choice. Because if I don't scream my butt off, Sean's going to scream better than I do, and I don't want that to <笑><笑>あの、まあ、役者っていうのは自分がやった役っていうのは愛さないといけないものなんですよ。どんなキャラクターであれ。で、もちろんあの、すべてのキャラクターを愛してるっていうのはすごくかっこよくは聞こえると
from him, so he's just so much a part of my life, and I feel like we, we grew, we both grew up in all these decades that I've been playing this role. And so yeah, so it's been just such a long time and it's always gonna be a part of my life. Almost, almost 32 years. Vegeta is one of the coolest, coolest characters ever. I played Dr. Claw, I played Wolverine, I played Venom, and Vegeta, honestly, he's still at the top. I mean, I, I don't have to explain why this scene was great, but um, just the moment where Vegeta does sacrifice himself and he puts his arm around his son. And, uh, I'm sorry. You have to have a heart of stone to play Vegeta, but it crushed me, man. Like, it just crushed me. And it was, it was a difficult emotional recording session because back in those days, we were working so hard to get the show on TV every week that we didn't even know what was happening. We didn't even have the materials up until the end of the show. So I didn't even know what was going to happen to Vegeta as things went along. So it was when he became a Super Saiyan, I was like, oh wow, that's awesome. And I think it, in a way, it's kind of the way that Ryo got to experience the series because he didn't know what the future was going to be either. We've had conversations about this. Like, one of the funniest things he ever said to me was, man, when I first started working on the show, I didn't even know if I was gonna make it 20 episodes because People die in this show. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, it's uh, th that was probably my favorite scene. Yeah, easily. So, I think it's a very good thing. 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 初めて家族を守るために自分を犠牲にして生きてるそこら辺がもう変わりつつあるというか今までの昼だっただけの男が初めて人のために犠牲になるということをした戦いだと思うんです最初あのマジンプートの戦いの時だと思うんですけどそうい
and still live to tell about it. And we've seen Mr. Horikawa do Final Flash, but I want to do something a little bit different to close out this epic first, maybe last time ever, hopefully not, but it is the first time ever that you're all in the same room. Can we do a triple Big Bang attack? Yeah. I mean, aren't we supposed to hear the Japanese of reference at first? I mean, isn't that <laughs> At the same time? At, at the same time. In fact, in fact, it would be cool if they could stand next to each other and put their arms out. Like they're, like they're going to really down somewhere. Can we do that to close out? Three, two, one, go. Big Bang! 